Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our first Meet the Icon event. This is a series that we are going to be hosting for the next couple of months. We're going to be doing once per month as Accountability Lab. Um, as Accountability Lab, we are an NGO um, that works towards um, ensuring responsible institutions, active citizens, and just ensuring and doing work towards good governance. So we run a campaign called Integrity Icon, and Integrity Icon is a campaign where we seek to find, celebrate, and honor people who work in the public service. So this could be anyone in any sort of department, Department of Health, Department of Education, Safety and Security. We've had quite a number of people that have won this campaign. And so what we seek to do is we seek to find these public servants who are going beyond the call of duty, who are doing an amazing job, and most importantly, who are serving with integrity. And so we have an entire public nomination system where anyone in South Africa can nominate any public servant we shortlist the top 30, then we shortlist the top five. We have a group of judges that then select um, these integrity icons who form part of our top five. We shoot very short videos about every integrity icon's work. And towards the end of the year, we host an award ceremony just to honor you know, these public servants. Because we know that there is a narrative that those who work in the public service are quite corrupt. But we also know that that is not the entire picture. There are those who work in the, the public service who are doing such an amazing job. And we as, as Accountability Lab really want to highlight these people for the amazing work that they do and just obviously to spotlight them as positive role models. So we're going to be hosting these Meet the Icon series just to have amazing conversations with past integrity icons that we have had. We've been running this campaign in South Africa for the past two years, and this is going to be our third year. Um, so this evening, we obviously have a very exciting guest with us tonight. We have an, a 2018 integrity icon with us. We have Dr. Miria Dalport. Um, and she basically works as a medical officer and she makes, works as a medical officer at the Ocean Hospital. Um, I think that's how she, she, she says it is. We were talking about, you know, the pronunciation and she kind of gave me the British one. So I think I've said it correctly, Dr. Mia. I hope I have. I've tried my best, uh, but that is what she does. And then, of course, we've got our amazing facilitator with us tonight. We've got Dr. Kanile. And she is a pediatric registrar. She works at the Rahima Musa Mother and Child Hospital in Johannesburg. And she's also the vice president of Mental Matters. So they're going to be in conversation today about all things, you know, being a medical doctor, working in the public service, and obviously serving with integrity. And then after that, we're going to give you a chance to ask him any questions that you want. So we're going to have an amazing question and answer session after that. Um, so we're going to get right into it and I'm going to just hand over to you Dr. Kamile um, for your conversation. Good morning, afternoon. I have no idea what time of day it is. I'm so tired. I hope everybody's having a fantastic <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> um, as said, my name is Dr. Nogu Kanyele. I'm currently working in Johannesburg and I'm very excited that you guys have asked me to come on board. Um, I was just reading up about some of the work that Integrity Icon does, Accountability Lab does, and I just want to say that as an organization that names and fames public servants, I think in a time such as this one and just in the general mm scheme of working as a health mm. professional in the, uh, the public sector, we really don't mm. get enough of um, recognition for people who are yep. actually doing great things. So I want to say thank you so much for allowing me to facilitate this session. And I want to get straight into it. Dr. Maria Dalfort, um, thank you so much for being here. How are you? Thank you. I'm actually doing quite great. I'm on a bit of a break at the moment, a bit of a leave. So, yeah, so my mental state is a lot better than it was maybe like a month ago. Yeah. That is incredible. And I'd love for us to get into that. And we'll talk about that later. But let's start from the beginning. 
Why did a young Maria wake up one day and decide, you know what, I'm going to do six years of medicine, two years of internship, one year of comserve, and then go into the big bad world and help to save people? <laughs> sure. It's a question that you get asked a lot as a doctor and you never know, should you give the answer that people think they want to hear or should you give the answer that's from your heart? Because a lot of the time they think that you're faking and you're being cheesy if you say that you genuinely get into medicine because you want to help people. Because if that is not the cornerstone of why you get into medicine, you're not going to last. Because like you said, it's six years of studying. It's two years of internship and it's a year of comserve. And then it's basically the rest of your life until you retire in the service of other people. So people think that you're being super corny if you say you get into it because you have a love for wanting to help people, wanting to problem solve, wanting to empower people to help themselves as well. And I think, I think you can relate to that when I, when I say that. And people often look at you like, mm, yeah, right, you got into it for the money. <laughs> when, you work, when you're working those 36-hour calls, trust me, and I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, you're not thinking about the money. You're thinking about your next patient, the next thing you've got to do, the, just your next task. So you need to have a deep, deep and abiding love for wanting to help people to get into medicine. Of course, I completely agree. I always yeah. tell my interns and any students that come past, three o'clock in the morning will tell you mm. if you actually are passionate mm. about medicine or not. Exactly. Because exactly. all the caffeine, all the personality, all of the mm. fake mm. goes out the window mm. and you're mm. going on raw emotion and exactly. just exhaustion at that point. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> tell us about your medical school experience. Where did you study and how was that uh, for you? So I studied at Stellenbosch University and for me it was a bit difficult because I'm sure you've seen all the uh, <laughs> the controversy at mm. Stellenbosch and you see how I look. Mm. So it was it was it was challenging. I really had to buckle down. I really had to find my own inspiration to motivate myself because I'm not saying it was a hostile environment but it wasn't the most friendly environment for somebody who'd gone to basically model C schools and not really known about racial tension because it, it sounds a bit absurd, but I started school in 95. So we, I was that first class of that bright eyed, there's no such thing as racism. And that followed me all the way through school, high school. And I never really saw people, it sounds stupid like to say, I never really saw color. Like I acknowledge people were different from me, but that didn't define how I saw them and how I call them my friends, et cetera. But yes, when we get to yeah. university, especially Stellenbosch, there was that immediately there's that clickiness and it was very mm. difficult to break it down. And I got through it. It wasn't the most easiest of, it wasn't the easiest time in my life, but I got through it. I met good people. Um, the faculty is amazing. The, the education you get is amazing. And the experience you get is also amazing. And something, I, I don't know if you can relate, but you go to medical school and you think, man, they give you the speech. You are the cream of the cream, you know? You that one. <laughs> I remember you're that like, first, yeah. You know, you, you that, you that, you know? And you feel, oh, you know, I'm amazing. And then the real work comes and you're in a class of 200 other people who are also as smart as you, if not mm. smarter than you. And you really need to find another way to define yourself because usually when you get into medicine, you're the smart kid. You're that mm. one who generally didn't really need to work really hard to do really well in school. You were able to do all these extra extracurricular activities to bolster your, um, your application. And now you're basically just struggling to get by. So medical mm. school humbles you. It humbles you. It makes you realize who you are as a person and makes you dig deep. It makes you find who you are at your core and what you have to give to the world. So yeah. for me, I learned, I learned my sense of humor was the thing that gets me going. And three o'clock in the morning is when my sisters can, can attest. That's when I make my worst jokes. Like my dad oh, jokes you on next You're level. You're laughing about so, absolutely so nothing. Everything, everything is a joke. But it's not a joke, but you, you need to find that thing that just keeps you going. So yeah. Yes. 
So it was. So a let's go into me. that. Let's yeah. just talking about the theme of things that yes. keep you going. So on yeah. campus, you mentioned that it was you know the faculty. You had some really good leaders who were in the um, faculty that were there with you. But off campus, because I feel that a lot of the time, as students, as medical doctors, our whole lives become work get the good marks, you need to study, you need to be a doctor, you need to be on call. You, your whole life is focused around that. So I try as much as I can um, to explore what do we do outside that makes us feel like we're not doctors? What was it for you in medical school before we get into your life as a doctor that you felt was really the thing that brought you back? You spoke about your humor. Are there any other things? Or maybe someone out there is thinking, I need to detach, how? So one of my other passions was, um, can I say English? I used to be a, I was a, a rabid reader. I would read mm. everything. I, and then I started writing short stories, which I will never tell you, but, <laughs> but those, those kind of short anecdotes, just things that kept me going and things like that. And I still write today, obviously under a pseudonym. So that keeps mm. me going. It, it's something completely different outside of medicine and it just, it's something that people out there in that world, they don't know me as a doctor. So I'm just me. Mm -hmm. So that for me was cool. Yeah. That's so my incredible. Friends, and you know. Yes. Yeah, so my friends know that I write, but they don't know what I write because I only want strangers to read what I write because I'm weird like that. <laughs> and I think it's very important to any of the students who are listening, he has to find your niche. So for example, yeah. with me, it was exercise. I really enjoyed working out, playing netball. I joined um, and signed up with the netball league at school. And it also gave me a reason to stay at school and work because I knew mm. netball practice was at six and I used to go home. Um, mm. I was staying at home at the time. So after class, we'd finish class at about four o'clock. I would study for those two hours. And then I know I've done my studying for the day. Done. I'm going to go and exercise. I get a good boost, you know, and I get to have a team event where I really work with other people and um, I get to learn team skills, but I also have a, a boost of endorphins that I get through my body. So now a young Dr. Mary is just qualified. You've now left the academic circuit. Tell us about what um, happened after that. Where did you do your internship, etc.? So I did my internship at Grote Skier Hospital because my, mm. mother was my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer in the last year of my medical studies. So oh, we, went through quite, yeah, we went through quite a tough time. So because of her medical reasons, I actually, I was able to stay in the Western Cape and I was able to do my internship at Grote Skier Hospital. That's so, a blessing, sure, because not a lot yeah. of people get that lucky. Exactly. So I've been in the, I was in the tertiary institution for quite a while because you know you study at a tertiary institution and then I did my internship um, also in a tertiary institution so when it came time to pick a uh, come serve post I was like I'm gonna put myself out there I'm gonna I'm gonna go rural oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna bite the bullet so to say and I'm gonna pick something and I was like mm, let me just squeeze oat swearing in there at number five you know just number five just to show that I I'm willing to move a bit further away from, you know, the comforts of the city. Mm -hmm. And then <laughs> they, they were like, you put Otsuerung, there you go. That's where you're going to be. For <laughs> some and I actually fell in love with Otsuerung. I went, I came here for my, cause, my comm serve year and I've never left. And I, I don't see myself leaving Otsuerung. There are challenges working in a, a rural hospital, no lie. But I've learned so much about myself. I've grown so much as a doctor that I don't see myself working anywhere else, actually, at this point now. That's absolutely so, amazing. And before we go yeah. into that, because I really yeah. want to delve into what it is that you enjoy about your job as a doctor, I'd just like to yeah. ask everyone, I'm seeing so many incredible comments and thank you so much for um, interacting with us, guys. There's a question and answer box that is in the chat. You can just send through um, all of your questions there and then we will address as many as possible at the end during our Q&A session. Um, so please do put the messages, the, the, the questions in there so that we don't have too much of a disruption in the chat because we really want to engage with you. Um, so... Dr. Maria, tell us about that. What is it that is your most favorite thing? And what do you enjoy the most about being a, jo a doctor? Excuse me. <laughs> so specifically about working in, in Otsurang, I'm going to, because Khrutiskir is like, it's, it's a distant memory. It's a fun memory, mm -hmm. but 
I've been living a completely different life. So I feel like a secret agent all the time touching this earphones, but these are, I hate these things. They keep falling out of my ear. So I know I look like this lame old weirdo, like, oh, uh, excuse me, ground control. No, don't worry. I didn't even know. Don't keep going. Are we listening? Because I'm noticing it. I, <laughs> so about, Oat is a very small town. So it has, it has good sides to it and really bad sides to it. Because no matter what you do, you always Dr. Delfort. So you'll be standing in line buying things and they'll be like, doctor, could you just uh, look at my rash? Uh, my child's been coughing for a while. And I'm like, mm, guys, mm, uh, you see, I'm buying like fast food here. I don't need you to look too closely at what is in my trolley, especially since I've counseled you as a diabetic patient that you need to eat healthier. So um, what I love, <laughs> so that's like the downside. But the, the amazing thing is you get to see the changes. So you'll mm-hmm. see a child that you sent across to, to George, which is our referral hospital, um, sick, and you didn't have much hope for that child. Like there was a, um, a girl, she was in our parish. She was sick I'm in, in, in our church. And I saw her like a few months later and she done, she looked so much better. So you get to mm-hmm. actually follow up on the patients, not necessarily in a particularly formal setting, but mm-hmm. you'll see the patients, they'll see you in pick and pay on their way. They'll be like, hi, ah! You remember me and you'll be like um then they'll tell you what they came in with and you'll be like oh my gosh look at how <laughs> you look you look so amazing so you get that personal you, it's a, that, that personal touch you, you get to physically see the impact you've had on people's lives and mm. it keeps you going especially now in this time of covid mm. Yeah. So you you spoke about um, there was an interview you did on integrityicon.org mm. and you um, you were talking about being a positive influence in the community and in people's lives. Um, you also went into saying that as a doctor, it's difficult to do so in the public sector because there's so many things that you see that you would like to do for the patients, but you're often constrained by the resources that are available. So I wanted yeah. to ask you, what are the challenges you find, number one, as a medical doctor, but also as a public servant in this country? So firstly, it's that, that whole attitude that there is that public sector is somehow second rate to private sector. Because yes. some people in our town, they will have gone and sought medical attention in the private sector. And then they'll be forced because of financial reasons to come to the public sector. And then in the public sector, people who come and make use of public sector services or public health services, they know they need to wait. They know there's always a waiting list somewhere. So you need to find a way to get that through to the, to the people that there's only so much for so many people and you Mm. need to, you are almost like the gatekeeper. You need to pick your battles with what you can do for your patient. It's not that you're giving them substandard service. You kind of, how can I say, you're doing it one, one piece at a time. So you're making sure that the task that you start, you can complete. So once you've completed that, you've gotten all the information. If you think of it as like a game, You go, you collect all the tokens that you can on the one level to give yourself the best shot at the next level. And for Mm. patients, it's often difficult. They they want a one and done service. And unfortunately, it's never like that because you have to do investigations. You have to do things to kind of prove your initial suspicion. It's like Mm. you're a detective. You can't just suspect everything. You must have like a top five. Then you work through your top five and then you go to the next level. So you can't move on if you haven't proven something on the one level. And it's difficult for patients to understand. They think that you're guessing. It's not Mm. guessing. (laughs) It it, it really isn't. And it's it's tough for them to understand. They want you as a doctor to just always have the answer immediately. And maybe it's something that's come from the past where people would make spot diagnoses. But Mm. we can't afford to do that anymore. There's so... There's so many things, so many factors out there. And South Africa has become a very litigious society that you, mm. you need to almost kind of practice a bit of defensive medicine. So you, so, and that's also a problem because then following up patients in the, in the public sector. And that's what I like yes. about the small town. If you are in the outpatient department, you follow up your patient. If you are in the ward, you follow up the patient in the ward if you see them again. Mm. So it's, it's a very close, because I think we're about 
14, 15 doctors in, in mm. the public in, at working at the Otsuring Hospital. So there's a lot of communication between us, which I don't think happens in the pub, in the private sector. So it's not that I'm putting down the private sector. It's an amazing thing. But what, what I'm saying, one of our strengths in the public sector is that there's a lot of communication between us as colleagues and you build very good network and very good bonds because we all understand that we need each other in order to help our patients to the best of our ability. Yes, I fully agree. And I think sometimes I shudder to think about the fact that, you know, at least at a hospital or at least at an academic hospital, you have so many levels of um, people who are giving information all the way from interns who've just qualified up to specialist consultants who are actively doing research, that sometimes it might be better to actually go into the States because you're constantly being reassessed, you're constantly having your diagnosis um, re-examined and made yes. sure that yes. you're doing the so right they thing. Ask you, they ask you, okay, I hear what you're saying, but how did you get there? Could you give me a bit more information? And when you have to sell a patient to a specialist, when you have to, because you must make the referral. So we have, it's often a telephonic referral. So it's not just like mm. write a letter and be like, bye. It's, I have to pick up the phone and say, mm. I have this patient. These are the reasons why I feel this patient has this condition. What more can I do on my level? And when can I refer them to you? And what are the investigations you need to get to, your, to, to, get to the next level for this patient? Mm. So it's, you often have to go back and you'll see like, oh, snap, I didn't do something. <laughs> then you must be like, oh. I just need to go and do that and then get back. Yeah. And then you learn for the next patient who has very similar symptoms and features like this past, these past couple of months, I've been having a lot of SLE patients, which as mm. everybody knows, if you don't have a special love for rheumatology, <laughs> it's quite uh, intense. <laughs> it is. So I've had a couple of them and I'm like, like I'd look like the one point I was like, mm, is this a joke? Like, am I seeing SLE around every corner because I want to see SLE and it was just I just because you know these things come in threes I'm sure yes. you, you like all these superstitions so I've had my three SLE so I'm wondering what my other three is gonna be because like <laughs> I speak to the consultant they'd be like again I was like I, 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 I can't I can't help it uh, they're just showing up at my door I can't help it and I work at the clinic now so it's even mm. more bizarre I'm like oh like the one lady came in she came in for something completely different and the sister asked me just to consult on this and I saw underneath a mask. I was like, ah, 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 what's that? Ah, that's a your mask a bit. And she has this male rash and I was like, oh no, 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 no. And I was like, but God, thank you. This last one is an easy diagnosis, but God, because you know that male rash. Thank you. Because ah, I had ah, another ah. lady that I had for six months and she comes in with these weird symptoms and I'd be like, I'm lost. Like, what does she have? And the specialist was like, did you think to do this test? And I was like, oh, no, I didn't. And then once I did the test and it came back positive, all the little pieces started falling into place. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> And just to expand on that, it's so interesting. And if you are a student and you're watching this, any case you come across, you don't have to do an in-depth topic and go into it sometimes even just a summary page on an up-to-date search because you guys in the university have access to that they have a summary and recommendations they give you quick overviews of things really like read it it takes you about 30 minutes but then you never forget it because you have a face that you can put yes. to that patient yes. um i just want to go face. on and i want to <laughs> exactly yes. i just want to speak about your work with the integrity icon um, yes. campaign so tell me about your experience and also what impact has it made for your life so it's forced me to reevaluate every interaction i have with my colleagues and especially with my my patients it's mm. forced me to think am i because in my in my short video i say integrity to me is doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do so yes. that last patient that walks in Oh, half an hour before your shift ends mm. when you just don't you know when you when you're at your lowest really you you yes. pass that that manic that manic high that you get like the last two hours of your call when you're pushing you're pushing you're pushing and the last <laughs> half hours when you're running on empty so i need to give my all for that last patient as i did for that first patient i had on my call mm. so it forces me to reevaluate all my interactions am i acting with integrity for this patient am i acting with integrity 
towards my colleagues? Am I acting mm-hmm. with integrity towards the nursing staff who are also my colleagues that, that work with me? Am I asking them to do things that aren't within their scope of practice because I, I don't know? Am I expecting a bit too much from them? Am I not giving them clear instructions on what I would like for the patients? And then if something happens to the patients, blaming them in the end? Or mm. you know, that, that, that kind of vibe. Because if you as the doctor don't give clear instructions, how are the sisters supposed to know what they're supposed to do for that patient? So it's, yeah. it's gotten me to think a bit deeper every time. And mm. uh, yeah, yeah. That's absolutely that's, that's, incredible. That's I good. really enjoy that you have an approach that says, I as a doctor am part of a team. I'm not the yes. be all and the end all. And I think oh, a lot of people... Yeah. Because doctors are held in such high regard in some communities, especially small communities, you know, the decisions that we make either become the final or they Mm. become very misunderstood. So I appreciate the fact that you realize that working in a team is part of what being a health professional is um, in this country. Your medicine will humble you. Your medicine (laughs) will humble you. If that sister does not like you, (laughs) you can be the doctor. She'll say, uh, my dear... (laughs) I've been a sister for longer than you've been alive. So especially at the clinic that I work at now, Bridgeton Clinic, shout out to Bridgeton Clinic. They, they, have, they are deeply, deeply, deeply in my heart. I don't know what people always had this very negative impression of this clinic. But when I went there, I was like, I'm going to be myself. I'm going to be part of the team. And I'm going to let them know that we are in this together. I'm not the doc. I'm not in charge. I'm not in charge. There's an OM. There's a who's in charge, who is trained to do managerial work. That is her function. She is the in charge. I am part of the team. I fall under that OM. I stand next to you in the trenches and we work these patients out together. And that goes for everyone from our cleaner to our, um, our dietitian, our physiotherapist to our pharmacy. We are, we all, we all work together. And I, and I, I love that clinic now. Like I went there, I was like, "Mm, I'm a bit apprehensive, but now I love it. (laughs) I love it. Yeah. So that's incredible. Thank you so much for that. Because I think not a lot of people teach that. Um, In a, in your integrity icon um, interview, you also stated that you always start by being honest with your patients. And just to quote directly, you say, if I tell them we are going to do this or do that for them, I make sure I follow through when it's done and they see that I'm interested in them and I like to follow up about what's going on. I try to keep my word to the patient and stick to the commitments I have made. So that, of course, is speaking to integrity, but that's also some advice that we might not necessarily have as part of the curriculum that gets taught in medical school. So what I'd like to ask you is what career advice can you give to medical students that isn't necessarily offered in school or even by professionals that they might speak to? So I saw there was a question that popped up. Have I ever thought of specializing? So the thing is, don't be in a rush to specialize. There's nothing wrong with specializing. If you have found that area of medicine that really lights your fire, that you can wake up every day for the rest of your professional life and do, go for it. But if you're someone like me, I really haven't decided. There isn't really a specific area that really calls to me. So I I haven't found that, that particular niche in medicine so why must I force myself into into a space that I I don't feel that I fit so that's also what what rural medicine offers you you are a medical officer so you will be you rotate through things so like an internship you do you do one part of medicine for a month but we we obviously don't have specifically internal medicine we'll we'll have you work in the female ward for a month you work in the male Mm -hmm. ward for a month so now, now we've got you work in the COVID ward for a month or two. Then there's theater, mm. then there's outpatients, and then there's the clinic. But I think, uh, I, I think I'm starting to find my passion for primary health care. Because mm. that, that, along with what I said in my interview, where you, you're honest with the patient, you, you tell them, look, this is what we can try and figure out at this level. These are the things I'm going to do for you. I will see you in a month's time. Then with those answers that I have there, we will move on to the next level. Don't promise things. Don't say, I'm going to send you to the specialist. Because when you don't do it at the next interview, the patient or at the next examination session, the patient loses their trust in you. And you have to, you have to find a way to build trust between you and your patients. Because yes. 
word of mouth carries a lot of weight. If that mm. patient feels that you're not going to listen to them, that you say you're going to do things for them, but you don't follow through, A, they won't follow your advice. B, they might not follow up for the, uh, the follow-up um, session with you. And you'll, you'll never get anywhere. You'll have all these things hanging in the air and you'll never actually get to anywhere with this patient. And people will lose trust in you as a doctor. They'll say you're a bad mm-hmm. doctor. And then patients won't want to come to you, won't want to mm-hmm. seek medical attention. And then they come, they seek medical attention when it's an emergency, when it's almost too late. And mm-hmm. then you, by then you've, you've, you've kind of missed the boat. And there's a lot of people who don't like coming for medical yes. investigations and examinations. They like, oh, nobody wants to be sick. So you have to be able to forge a bond with your patients. Mm-hmm. I just yeah. wanted to go a little bit yeah. deeper into that yeah. um, communication with our, with our patients and just people in general. Um, mm. I find a lot of the time, you know, we're expected as doctors to know the answers. Like you said in the beginning, we're expected to have a diagnosis. Um, and sometimes I also find that there's times in my profession where I have to tell moms, I don't know. I'll yes. find out for you. Yes. Um, yes. And the one question that patients always ask is, but they're fine, right? And sometimes you... I think, what do you find is your experience with having to say, I don't know, I can't tell you, um, I don't have the answer right now. How do you feel you need to communicate that to patients and to people um, in your community? It's always good to, because people put doctors on a pedestal. So they think we superhuman. So when you have a moment of human vulnerability, they're shocked, they're scared. Mm. So usually when I... Like I'll take my example at the clinic, for example. I will come out and I'll greet the people. I'll be like, hey, so cool. And, you know, I'll, I'll just have like a chat with them. So they see that I'm human. I put my, my pants on one leg at a time. And then when <laughs> I call them in, I'll be like, yeah, because they, and, and most of the time, the way I look, they don't even know that I'm the doctor. They think I'm just sitting there and I'm in the office and I'm waiting for the doctor because I've had it happen. I've got mm-hmm. the scalpel in my hand and I'm about to do the cesarean section. And the person accompanying the patient is like, when is the doctor getting here? But they ask it in Afrikaans, no, when is doctor? Ah. And then I'll tell, them, <laughs> I'll tell them, it's fine. I'll start so long, the doctor's coming. So I'll make a joke. And most people are like, why would you make a joke like that? I'm like, because <laughs> that's, that's how I am. So I, I try to use humor, but some patients are just like, why don't you know the answer? And I'm like, look, I am learning and growing every day as a doctor. The work that I do is solid. I ask advice when I feel I need to ask advice. I don't know what question to ask the specialist about you yet. So it won't make sense. Let me do these things, these things, these things, and these things. Then at the next um, time we see each other, we will then make a decision, pick up the phone to speak to the specialist, or by then I I may have the answer. So it's all about honesty. And it's all about, I think, teaching patients that doctors are not God. We don't always have the answers. Life is uncomfortable and life will always remain uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And your health is a partnership between you and me. Because as soon as they, as soon as they feel that you are supposed to know everything and do everything, they expect you to fix them. And unfortunately, Mm -hmm. if you have a chronic disease of lifestyle, I cannot fix you. I can give you the tools to maintain your health but it's a Mm. partnership between you and me. Because if you start seeing me as a human being on your team, as a teammate with you, Mm. then the patients are more inclined to do the things that involve lifestyle changes because it's not easy. They want a tablet to fix their diabetes. They want a tablet to fix their hypertension. They want a tablet to fix their heart condition. And it's not going to fix it. You have to change your lifestyle. You have to grow and growth is painful. Exactly. And And it goes right back to integrity, having the integrity to acknowledge where you are weak, where you are strong, and then trying as much as you can to fix those gaps. I want to get one more question in before we take questions from um, everyone else. Um, Thank you so much for everyone. And if you have a question that you'd like to ask, please do slide it into the Q&A box and we will answer it um, as we go along. 
Um, you spoke about working in COVID wards and you also mentioned um, when we were speaking about um, not knowing the fact that sometimes we just don't know. And in a time like mm -hmm. coronavirus and yeah. this pandemic that's happening, there's a lot we don't know, a lot of mental and physical illness that we have to deal with that we have yeah. no idea about because we've never experienced it. We've never been taught about it. So yeah. what is the mental and emotional toll of being a doctor for you, particularly during this time? So it's the uncertainty. The things that we knew last week, the things that we knew last month have been disproven. Medications yeah. that we thought would be the silver bullet, no. The vaccine that we thought would, uh, no. People just not wanting to listen to basic advice because they want you to fix them. And mm. I, they, COVID is not a time where I can fix you. I can support you. I can give you advice to not spread it. I can give you advice to try and prevent you from getting it. But if you have it, I can only support you. Your body yes. must fix itself. And that's very, very scary because we, we aren't used to this. We are used to saying, okay, you have this and this is the antibiotic. This is the antiviral that works for this. And yes, you must do all those lifestyle things, but don't worry. There's always still that tablet. So it's always still, I'm still pulling 70% and you are doing 30%. But now everybody has to give 50-50. Because if you're not going to do the things that have been proven to slow down the spread of infection and you get it and you're one of the high risk patients, I can only mm -hmm. support you because there are very strict, you know, ICU criteria and things like that. And you have to look the patient's family in the eye when you admit, say the 72 year old diabetic that looks like they have COVID that has COVID symptoms that's been swapped up for COVID and you have to look that family in the eye and you have to tell them you need to make preparations that perhaps grandpa is not going to come home you need to be mm. honest with them from the jump and that takes a toll and how has that because, affected you how has that yeah. mentally affected you as a doctor working in such a small community so we have, a, we have a newspaper called The Heri. It's the free newspaper that's kind of given out around town every Thursday. So I have this obsession now. I turn to the page of the deaths and I see, do I recognize these people? And it's really sad because I'll be like, I just spoke to this person a month ago about their condition. And I heard they had it. And our town is very small. Very, very, very small. <laughs> so I had like a shock. I got a phone call from the hospital asking me about more medical information for a particular patient. I was like, why are you looking for that information? And sure. they're like, oh no, because this patient has COVID. I'm like, I just saw this man two weeks ago. I sure. just congratulated him because he's a warfarin patient. I just congratulated him that he'd been therapeutic for I don't know how long. He's doing well. He's doing everything he's supposed to do for COVID. And still he got it. Mm -hmm. So... It, it does take a big strain on you because you know these people, they, they're not just a name, they're a face, they're a story. Mm. They're somebody that maybe you would regularly buy fruit and vegetables from on the street mm. corner. They're somebody that would work in the shop that always, you know, packs the washing powder. People that you, yeah. that you know, that you have, even if it's just a passing connection with them. It's somebody that you'd see, it would be, the guy, the car guard that always makes sure that when you come to collect your post at the post office, he's always there waving, hey, yes. <laughs> that person is not going to be there anymore. Yeah. It's, it's a much more personal sense of loss nowadays because mm. people will be fine and then they won't be fine and then they'll be sure. dead. And it takes sure. a big strain on you. So... Uh, okay, I'm going to be very open. I'm seeing a psychologist on Saturday. So I'm, I've actually gone and I've made an appointment with her and I'm seeing her because I specifically said I want to talk about coping skills, things that I can yes. do in the immediate, like that immediate debriefing session, things that I can do beforehand to kind of prepare myself and things that I can do in the long term when, you know, when the immediate debriefing, it's just there for that immediate pain, that immediate stress, that immediate, mm. you know, that, that, feeling of, I don't know, impending doom and what can I do afterwards once I've worked through that to mm. kind of build up my mental resilience. So, sure. yeah, you, I, you, know, you should never be Maria, afraid. <laughs> yeah. We can talk the whole day. Well, uh, <laughs> Let's establish that. We're yeah. going to have to talk 
the yeah. whole day another day because <laughs> i really want us to get to all of the questions that a lot of people are asking sure. so we've got sure. already like 12 or 13 questions that we've got to answer so Ooh. i'm just going to try okay. and see if we can get through as sure. many as possible sure Rapid so fire. the first okay. one is what have you come to appreciate more that you find people take advantage of Ooh. <laughs> yay you here you must know <laughs> sure i think people people tend to take advantage of me because i come across as quite a softy mm. so uh people people tend to take advantage of that i would see very often but now i've started to appreciate that softness in myself that mm. i still have that softness i haven't become hardened i haven't become toughened by the world to such a point that i can't empathize not just sympathize but empathize with my patients because oh. it's not just i'm sorry for you it's i'm sorry with you I, yes. I, I i'm trying to feel what you are feeling at this moment mm -hmm. so i can put myself in your shoes so that i can ask what would i want out of this situation and how can i help you to help yourself in that kind mm. of way so, yeah um, or Adile then also asked the second question, what has, uh, what was one of your biggest sacrifices? <laughs> hey, it's hot here. It's hot. <laughs> so I'm very close to my family. I've, uh, mm. I actually, they, they live with me now. So, but that year that I had to live without them, that was big because mm. I had to learn to put on my big girl shoes and and stand by myself and be you know by myself be an adult by myself i didn't like it yeah i didn't like it. i didn't like it i <laughs> sent in a complaint i sent in a complaint to bra god and when my folks got into a bit of a financial situation i was like you know what i have a house please <laughs> so, <laughs> and privacy giving up your privacy giving up your privacy because everything you do is scrutinized you will post something. Someone will slide into the DMs and ask you like deep questions. You, somebody will have your WhatsApp number that they got from the call roster. And they'll be like, I'm going to WhatsApp that. Yes, yes. My child has diarrhea. Should I take my child to the clinic? Yes. Oh, no, but I, uh, yes. Take your child to the <laughs> clinic. So, yeah. You know, your, your privacy, your, your space. Because people seem oh. to think that because you were a doctor, you're always on call. You're always on standby. Yes. You're always there. You you need to always have an answer for them. You can't just if you're buying wine, sorry, which you can't do now. But if you're buying wine, they'll be like, oh, I didn't you know. drink wine. <laughs> and you'll be like, Have you seen my life recently? Wine is open. <laughs> yeah. So you know, you're bringing up a good point about the time yeah. because someone else was also asking a question, and they also asked anonymously that they're a medical student and they are yes. struggling with their time management. So, do you have any tips? So, start with the thing that you dislike the most, babes. Start yes, start with that. That is going to take you the longest. Leave the thing that you like for last. Organize. Try and get yourself. Don't set yourself too much of a timetable. Say maybe block out certain sh blocks of time whether it's a half an hour an hour um two hours for you start with the thing that you dislike the most and take regular breaks mm. if you are like me the more stressed i become the less i sleep so if i'm just gonna lie in bed staring at the ceiling okay i plan a nap when i'm tired so what what i would do is i come from class especially when we would have block week I'd be that weirdo, like, people are like, why are you watching series? We're supposed to be studying. I'm like, I'm on a break. <laughs> They're like, how can you be on a break? I'm like, it's fine. Two o'clock in the morning when you're sleeping, I'm going to be awake anyway. So mm. I've had my series time, I've eaten, I've taken my nap, which could be an hour or so. And then two, three o'clock when you wake up with that existential crisis of why am I here? Why am yes. I studying something? <laughs> And you're like, hmm, please bring that book. It's part of my schedule. Then you don't stress that you're losing time, that you're supposed to be sleeping. You don't stress that you have to pack things in. And mm. you, you start learning how to, how to kind of manage your anxiety and do things that would help you with your anxiety instead of amplifying it. Mm. If I can also jump in, you know, there's different YouTube videos where they actually, you can study with them. So there's one technique called the Pomodoro technique, where you study for 25 minutes, you rest for five, you study for 25 minutes, you rest for five. 
And I found that actually using a technique like that has really made me effective. And the other thing I do is I do something every day. So as I'm a doctor, I work from eight to four. And then I know that maybe um, for an hour a day, I read something. Sometimes I do more. Sometimes I do less, but never less than about 45 minutes because then those small chunks add up over the week. And as students, you know, you have, you might not be in lectures the whole day or you might not be at the hospital the whole day, um, but then you'll have time in between. Don't use that time to chat and go on Instagram. Use that time to work, chat to a mom, practice your history taking because you have all of that time now and you don't, you know, you want to go home and sleep, babes. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, speak, to, speak to his sister even on my calls i kind of tell myself four hours we're gonna mm. we're gonna bust it four hours we're gonna bust it then for 20 minutes i'm gonna drink some tea i'm gonna talk some crap with my sisters we're gonna <laughs> regroup, and then four hours we're gonna grind it we're gonna grind it out so it, it helps you that i love that 25 minutes on five minutes off 25 minutes on five minutes off that's brilliant yeah. if that if that can work for you then that's Mm. So Bradley Adendorf has just asked, um, can one use by bio, use a biomedical sciences degree to get into medicine? And I just want to answer this quickly so that we can knock it out. Okay. There's different um, universities in the country that allow you to do what's called a shortened medical medical degree or graduate entry medical program. I know this is the one. Um, I'm not sure of the other ones, but we can find out for you. But basically, you just use your degree and the points allocated from that degree. You write an entrance exam, which basically has the basic sciences. So your um, chemistry, anatomy, um, biology, etc. And if you pass that degree um, and they use the points together, then they can allow you to enter into medicine. Then you don't do the full six or seven years. You just do the clinical years. All right. Um, moving on, someone is um, asking, what, what advice would you give a preclinical student who is about to transition to the clinical years, Dr. Maria? So at Stellenbosch, mm-hmm. so you need to realize you're going to look stupid. You're going to ask yeah. a stupid question question you're going to be called upon in a group session in front of a patient and not know the answer the patient is going to not give you the full history patients are not going to i don't know give you all the information you need or they can give information to the to the more senior the the registry and a lot of it just comes with how you introduce yourself to the patient you say hi i am media and i never give my i never used to give my son and my son was on my name badge so i was like hi i'm media reach across shake the hand and i'm like i'm the medical student today today my task is to get a history from you so I would really appreciate it if you could answer my questions as honestly and as openly as possible. Because that's usually where we start. Sorry, my sinuses. We usually start with history taking. Then when you move on to the physical examination things, that you just have to do the best you can. You will miss some signs, but you just do the best you can and you learn that just because you make a mistake, you're not a failure. These things happen and medical school is about learning to improve yourself every year and with every patient interaction yeah definitely um the other thing that um shoot i've lost some of the questions um if i can just ask um samina just to send through some of the questions but one of them that i did see um sorry my video has popped off sorry one of them uh, that i did see was that um Opportunities for career development. What do you see lying ahead for medical officers besides specializing? So a lot of people think that it's just about doing the clinical thing and going into opening a practice or making sure that they're working as a GP or they're specializing somehow. Do you know of any other fields that people could go in? So being a medical officer means that you basically, you consigning yourself to never really knowing what's going to walk through your door. So it would be about continuing to keep yourself sharp in everything and everything and anything. So I I don't know people, some people seem to 
discount that but every day is about reading up on certain things because especially now with the pandemic when we haven't had specialist outreach services i, I must become the rheumatologist I, I, I must become the cardiologist me me this mm. one me the only thing thank goodness they're not expecting me to become is the surgeon because then mm -mm, mm -mm, this one can only oh. do very few operations but i do them well but you know just, just those ones you know just those yeah. ones that i need to do so uh, it's 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 continual professional development in and of itself because you will have a patient say at your outpatient department you won't have a cooking clue what's going on with this patient mm -hmm. you will then You'll do the, you know, you'll do the basics. You'll arrange the follow-up examination. You'll be honest with the patient. You speak to the consultant. I often, our especially our internal medicine department, very open. I love my internal medicine specialist. Um, tie in mm. on that side, Dr. Miranda Smith. She is amazing. You send me <laughs> email. She will ask you a whole lot of questions, give you a whole lot of options, and then you'll be like, oh, okay, so now I've got to go and read. So she, yeah. the way she helps you she doesn't give you the answer she lets mm, you she wants you to investigate it yeah so that the next time you have a similar patient you take it a step further definitely that's, that's totally what i love so every day is a new opportunity to learn and to grow and yes maybe your your title won't get more but you it, if you are working towards a title then sweetie mm -mm, medicine is not it for you because yeah it will humble you, it will humble, you humble you humble you humble you yeah so every i'll ask three more questions just because we're running out of time and i just don't want okay. to lose all the information that you're going to give to the people because they're really asking incredible questions um someone is asking given the state of healthcare system in SA and the challenges that come with being a doctor in south african public hospitals why dr maria do you choose to still stay in medicine because if i stay who if i don't stay who else will they be? Because then I'm just putting the responsibility on somebody else. If I see a problem and I have the skills and the ability to kind of counteract that problem, why must I leave it to somebody else? And if by mm. me staying, I can inspire other people to stay, then you, 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 you're part of the solution. You're not going to mm. be the solution. You will be part of the solution and you can inspire yes. other people. So, because if everybody just leaves the public sector, who's going to be left behind? Because in the Western Cape, I saw a statistic, 75% of our population makes use of public health care. Mm. So, if I don't stay, how can I tell other people to stay? Mm. That's so very that true. Thing of be the change you want to see in the world. That's very, very true. true. And, yes. and just going into that, you know, there was another question um, where I think it was Sonto. Um, she, oh, no, no, it wasn't Sonto. It was, yeah, it was Sonto. Would you advise doing, uh, would you advise, excuse me, doing internship in a tertiary hospital and why? So I did mine at Chris Honey Baragwana. Absolutely loved it. I was exhausted all the time, but I mm. learned the right way to do things. And also because there were so many levels, I was forced to learn the, the, mm. the, the academic way of doing things. What do you feel, Dr. Mira, is the best thing for students? Should they choose? Because a lot of people are choosing where to do their internship now. Mm. Tertiary, rural, secondary, what do you think? Oh. Like I said, rural humble you. I think rural medicine should be left for come serve and above because it's not that we don't have time to teach the junior doctors. It's there's so much responsibility. And I felt that crushing weight when I walked in there on my first call as a come serve doctor. You are by yourself. Mm. So you are making that decision. But yes, the people are there telephonically, but in the heat of the moment, you are making that decision. And I don't think it's fair to put that responsibility on an intern's shoulder. So mm. regional hospitals are fine if you want to go a bit outside, like, um, for example, our referral hospital, George, because there you work with a consultant or a specialist MO or registrar. So you always have that support so that you, you have the ability to kind of spread your wings a bit because you know if you, if you kind of crash that, there's somebody, there's a safety net for you. Because rural mm. medicine is the game. So I would, I would love to encourage people, more people to do their comserve in, in rural hospitals. You learn yeah. so much. If you walk, if you decide to stay like me, <laughs> we will be only too happy to accept you. If you, when you leave, you will have grown so much. You will have pushed 
you will have pushed yourself to your boundary and you will have you will have learned really where your limits lie so yeah, yeah. So then let's take the last question. And I'm so sorry that we couldn't answer everybody's questions today. But I think this is an important one. And it comes from, um, actually, it doesn't have a name. But um, they say, thank you, Dr. Kanye and Dr. Mario. You are very welcome. Um, in medical school, what were the challenges you came across that affected your mental health? And when you were at your lowest because of academics, what kept you going? And what was your coping mechanism? How did you deal with failure? So that is a good question a very good question because mm-hmm. like i said you are told you are the cream of the cream you are the number one you are the and you've always sort of defined yourself as your academic marks so when you fail failure it's not the end it is a learning opportunity it is a chance to really dig deep to find why you do medicine and also to learn to ask for help because we are we kind of shamed i failed i should just quit i should just leave i shouldn't stick it out i shouldn't say what can i do how can i improve myself how can i work that little bit extra in order to kind of compensate for the areas that i'm lacking Mm -hmm. and without failure you won't learn really what it is to succeed because if you've always just gotten everything, everything mm. loses. So that first failure that you have in medical school, you must embrace it. You must learn what it is that made you fail. What are the external factors? What are the internal factors that led to that failure? Was it because I didn't manage my time appropriately? Was it because I didn't notice my signs of my anxiety? what are those red flags that I can look back with hindsight into realizing Mm. this is so that the next time you get into that situation, you can kind of nip it in the bud. You can kind of turn it around for yourself. So don't be afraid to ask for help. Find out more of who you are. So like I said, for me, it was my humor. It's my writing. It's, things that are completely external to medicine, find something else, but you must have an internal motivation as well. So if you are just in medicine for the wrong reasons, then that failure won't push you to improve yourself. That failure will make you just throw in the towel and just leave it. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think, especially when you find failure, people are scared of being shouted at. And I think the reaction that other people failure is more indicative of them than it is of you. Because different people, especially people who are really assured in themselves and really are not afraid to help you or help guide you through whatever situation happened. And sometimes people who are insecure themselves or maybe people are incredibly stressed, have a lot of pressure on their shoulders, will react and shout. It doesn't mean that you are wrong. It doesn't mean that you are a horrible person. You made a mistake. And it's important that you acknowledge that the mistake was made and that you move yes. forward from it yes. with learning opportunities. Yes. Don't take it don't as a personal attack on up. you. Don't beat yourself up too much because really you are your own worst enemy. If you yeah. tell yourself that this one failure defines who I am, then it will define who you are. It will be sure. the end for you. It will, take, it will suck all the joy that you got out of medicine. It will just suck it completely out of the room. But if you learn to tell yourself that, if you learn to say, I expect to make mistakes. Like I said, when you're in the clinical setting, you will ask a dumb question. You will be a dumb question. You will be asked something that you don't know the answer to. And the, the correct way to reply to that is, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer right now, but I will go and read up about it. I think that is an absolutely perfect way to end. How dare you? I don't know the answer, but I will read up about it. And it keeps you humble. It keeps you grounded. It does. It really does. And I just want to say thank you for ending it on such an important note because people forget that we are, at the end of the day, just human beings and we need to be grounded and we need to be humble so that we can learn, not just from mistakes that we make, but from learn from one another. So Dr. Mira, I want to say thank you so much. And also to everyone that tuned in, thank you for all of the questions. I'm so, so sorry that we couldn't get to everybody. But like I said, we could talk the whole day. All day. (laughs) 
Um, I would like to thank you again for your time and just for your service, for your integrity, for the fact that you're able to hold your public service in high esteem and that other people are also recognizing you for that, that we can name and fame you for an incredible public servant that you are. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thank you to Perfect. you. Like, Mental matter sounds amazing. <laughs> we definitely need to chat about that. Yes, we definitely will. So I will be handing over back to the Accountability Lab. Thank you for this opportunity and have a fantastic evening, everybody. Guys, do you see our doctors? That's what I was thinking about the entire time. I was like, do you see our doctors? That was <laughs> such an amazing conversation between really two cool, dope, inspirational human beings and doctors who are really like serving in our communities and just making such a significant contribution to our society. So thank you so much for that. Um, I just want to thank you so much, our Integrity Icon 2018, Dr. Miria Delfort, the amazing, the wonderful <laughs> Dr. Kanile for facilitating this lovely event. It was real, it was raw. You guys dropped a lot of wisdom, a lot of nuggets, you know, that I hope the, the students pick up on. Um, yeah, you know, unfortunately, the webinars come to an end. But like I said, we're going to be hosting one Meet the Icon webinar per month till the end of the year. So we will be back. Follow us on social media just to, you know, find out when our next event will be. You can find us on Facebook. Um, Accountability Lab South Africa or Twitter, Instagram at Account Lab South Africa. And yeah, most importantly, I just want to say thanks to the students. We had so many universities repping from across South Africa. So thank you guys so much for attending. Um, I mean, we're going through a pandemic, guys, that hasn't been easy. So we just wanted to, you know, sparkle some inspiration. And we hope that we did that to let you guys know, you know, keep pushing Keep studying, those, keep studying really, really hard. Your dreams are super attainable. Um, you can and will make a difference in people's lives. So I hope, you know, this pushed you guys just a little further and let you guys know you can do it and to continue pushing. So guys, thank you so much. That is it from us, from Accountability Lab. Take care of yourselves, stay safe, and have a good evening further. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's been great. Ooh, cool, cool.